Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, we can't lie. We're always going to have a soft spot in our heart for science fiction. And I mean, I think it's because the genre can actually create some really interesting talking points for stuff that's going on in the world today in a really sort of, well, I guess in an interesting and you know, borderline philosophical way, really. It's, it's not just a... It's it's so much more than just you know tr- you know trying to talk about issues. It, it really speaks to the human experience, uh, and that's what we try to do too. Because you know what, if you're within the sound of our voice, guess what? You must be in the seats with once more, as always. My name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast where we sit down with a wide ranging variety of entertainment industry professionals and pick their brand about current projects, state of the industry, how they got started, and so very much more in a light and in a conversational fashion. And you know, if you like how we do things around here, I'm gonna I'm gonna go on a limb and, and, and kind of assume that you do because, well, you're listening. Where else would you be? But uh, you know, if you want to keep listening, we would appreciate it. If you go to your podcast provider of choice, hit that subscribe button, hit the like, and give us the old five-star rating. Uh, we're pretty much everywhere. We're over at Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google, all your favorite uh, providers for podcasts. And plus, we archive every single one of our episodes over at our In The Seats YouTube channel. So if you can give us a like and subscribe there as well, we would absolutely appreciate it. Uh, also, don't hesitate to follow us on social media. We're on the Facebook we're on the Twitter, we're on the Instagram, we're on the TikTok, and we're on the Letterboxd for all sorts of fun updates. And finally, and we do dare say most importantly, please pay us a visit over at In The Seats, intheseats.ca, for all the latest and greatest from the world of uh, film, television, basically the moving image at large. Because, you know, if we love to uh, watch it and write about it and talk about it, we love it when you come by and read about it and listen about it. So please, do us the kindness and pay us a visit. On this episode, boy, I've been rambling, but this is a good, good episode. We are diving uh, into the future, the near future, as it were, in the world of artificial intelligence, simulants, and, well, the film Simulant, which uh, was in theaters uh, yesterday, this uh, this past Friday. Uh, the seventh, it uh, it stars Sam Worthington. It stars Jordana Brewster. It stars Robbie Amell, Shimu Liu, uh, and it's it's basically a bit of a Blade Runner riff. Uh, it's the story of a humanoid AI's attempt uh, to to win over uh, a widow, who you know he looks like the husband, and you know they replicated him and turned him into an AI, but the this man is trying to fall in love with his uh, wife who thinks you know rightfully so that that he is deceased but on the opposite end of that there is a government agent played by Sam Worthington who's trying to stop the rise of the machine consciousness uh there's a lot of layers going on in this stuff it was shot in Hamilton it is a Canadian production so it's it's I won't lie it's got a bit of a budget like a small budget but if eh, what the film does is, again, it allows for conversation. It sparks conversation, which is, I think, the important thing when it comes to science fiction. And, quite frankly, we had a really good conversation when uh, we had the unique pleasure of sitting down uh, talking with the director of the film, uh, Canada's own April Mullen, uh, and we talked about some of the fam- familiar themes in the film, which, uh, again, has been played out in in other features. But at the same time, what this kind of sparks and what this kind of makes you want to think about because I mean with the rise of what's happening with AI and sort of uh, chat GPT and all the all the quite frankly moderately terrifying things that uh, can happen nowadays when it comes to artificial intelligence uh, it's it's a conversation that's worth having and that's why movies like this get made because I mean again this is the whole point of art it's going to spark conversation it's going to spark interesting stuff and if you're a sci-fi junkie who, you know, really appreciates sort of the levels that films like this do and try to start, try to get to and try to get us to, to think about, uh, I think you're going to enjoy it. But uh, like I said, Simulant is in theaters now. But first off, please enjoy our talk with the director of the film, April Mullen. Uh, we, she's a regular guest on the show, She's a, and she's a good one. It's a good conversation. But uh, like I said, Simulant is in theaters now, but first, talk 
listen to our talk with April Mullen because, well, I enjoyed it and I hope you do too. Well, I mean, obviously, just officially, I mean, just again, thank you so much for the time today. It's great to see you again. I mean, and congrats on this movie. I loved it. Oh, thanks so much. So many, you know, nobody's seen it yet. So it's very exciting. It's finally getting world premieres. <laughs> now, I mean, I, I guess walk me through the story of uh, this script uh, sort of hitting your desk. That was, I got to say, the script hit my desk at least six years ago okay. when I read it. So it was like very refreshing at the time because AI was very far removed from our current society. And it, you know, the thought of what actually happens in the film felt very ridiculous. And right. um, now we're much closer with, you know, GP, with chat GPT and everything that's, you know, I feel like the film is a lot more current than when I originally read it. Uh, it's kind of happening as we speak, which is <laughs> terrifying and exciting, I guess. <laughs> no, absolutely. And I mean, it's one of those things where it's, again, it's pulled out of the moment. And I mean, it's just one of those sci-fi things that, I mean, this is the kind of sci-fi for me that it, it hits my wheelhouse because it's the kind of makes you think, it's the kind of make, makes you talk. But I mean, at the same time, like, I, I've got to find out because I mean, obviously, you know, funding independent sci-fi is always going to be, a, is, is, a, is a tough sell. Like, walk me through, I guess, just the process of getting this made, especially with this loaded cast that you have as well. Because, I mean, again, there's a lot of big names in this, which in a film that's very sort of intellectual. Thank you. It is meant to be very thought provoking and it is intellectual and very independent. Um, you know, being Canadian, shot, made and uh, everything, even the VFX artists, you know, it's nothing nothing compared to what the budget is on a much larger film like Avatar or something. <laughs> uh or even something like Arrival. Definitely, you know, there was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears poured into the film. And when it first came out into market, believe it or not, while we were casting, it was the height of COVID. Mm. So the film would have went prior to the pandemic, but it just sort of, uh, unfortunately, was the victim to the pandemic. So, you know, we were almost ready to start going out to cast and then the pandemic hit. So then that slowed the film making process for this one down quite significantly. So, you know, cast was reading throughout the pandemic and um, we got Sam attached at the tail end of the pandemic. And he was our first cast member to be attached as the role of Kessler. Uh, we were super thrilled and over the moon because he really brought a lot of heart and humanity to the role of Kessler. You know, off the page, you know, Kessler could come off as very dry and far removed from his heart, but Sam brought a very grounded, vulnerable, beautiful performance to the role of Kessler. And so, um, and that I have to say, uh, kudos to my producing partner, Tim Doran, who kept the fight going at all costs for this movie to be made and cast the best cast we, you know, we've had to date with our Wango films. Um, it, you know, it was extremely challenging because of the pandemic, but he kept going and going and, you know, pressing agents and knocking on doors and calling and calling. And uh, we did a lot of it ourselves. And then um, the next to attach was Jordana Brewster, which is a phenomenal addition. And again, playing a role that she doesn't usually get to play. Uh, you know, there are so many layers in her going on in mm. her scenes yeah. at all times. It's mind blowing because she's being triggered by the voice and the mannerisms of her deceased husband. She is invested in that relationship but torn up on whether to keep the simulate alive. There's these moral, you know, massive questions around the whole thing and also a huge amount of disappointment because it isn't what she thought it would be. Um, even though they decided together to get simulants, it sort of all is a lot different than she thought. So she's going through grief, um, questioning and sort of really shock throughout the whole film. So uh, Jordana had so much, you know, rain that she had to play and subtext that she had to play at all times. She was phenomenal too. So she came on board next and then, Robbie Amal joined the joined as Evan, which was he's the perfect everyman. You know, he had this very brilliant, stoic performance, which felt both human and simulate at the same time. And it's a it's a very tough balancing act. And I always had compassion for him, for what he was going through, mm. you know, kind of coming to terms with the fact that his life was over and having to go through that like he 
he brought this like very heartfelt compassionate side to Evan that I never you know dreamt we'd be able to achieve I was always hoping that people would feel for him um and I think he did such a phenomenal job in bringing the audiences in to his world and and what it's like to you know have the memories of a life lived but then being told that you that's not you and how do you deal with that I mean that's a huge <laughs> can of worms um and then uh Certainly not least, Simu Liu came to the table uh, at, and his performance, I believe, is like his strongest of his career so far. I think that he found, again, this heartbeat and generosity and this poetic sort of beauty towards humanity and what it meant to coexist alongside simulates. And he sort of like balanced the film in a way against, you know, the, the hard chase side of the film. He was sort of like the romantic heartbeat of the film uh, and sort of like the homage to humanity. And I, uh, which is ironic, but we won't tell why or any of that stuff because no <laughs> one's seen the movie. But um, I really appreciated his thoughtfulness and his performance. So that's how the cast kind of came together. And, um, and prep was during Omicron. So prep we were getting ready to film in Hamilton, but we had to be all remote because it was at the height of Omicron. It just had hit. And we didn't know whether we, we were going to have to push to camera or not. Like yeah. it was sort of on a daily basis waiting for the government and the updates and what was going to happen. But um, everybody prepped from remote offices, which was quite challenging considering the creative big concept of what the film is and creating the world, um, the world, the lo-fi world of simulate sort of had to be created remotely and sort of through a massive amount of photos and like me describing things until I was purple and like <laughs> um, giving so many photo references and trying to hand draw stick people and mirrors and um, octahedrons and what they would look like when they open like the inside of a crystal. I mean, all of these things were done remotely, which was very different than being in person. And then we went to camera and it was a quick, you know, 22 days it was so fast because our budget was so tight and our cast availability was very tight as well. And then, and then after that, after we wrapped, we had, you know, so many VFX shots that were created from around the world. So there were artists from all over the globe sort of working as quickly as we could to get to meet our deadlines, but it was super ambitious and um, it required a lot of different companies and artists from everywhere to come together to create simulate. Well, I mean, this really does feel like a, a, a perfect storm of a movie because, I mean, obviously you got Shimu right at this perfect time before the Marvel thing really started to take a hold. You got time with Sam before he got back into that kind of Avatar world. And, I mean, it made, it, it made such a great marriage. And, I mean, in watching the film, I mean, there's going to be comparisons to stuff like Blade Runner, but, I mean, as I was watching it, I was so struck by how conscious you were of of not trying to make it overtly futuristic, but still giving it a look. Can you talk to me a little bit, just uh, sort of the work you had to do with the cinematographer to 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 shoot it properly? I guess would be the right way because you didn't want it to be overly sci-fi, but it still had to look a little otherworldly at the same time. Yeah, there was a lot of creative discussion going in on even sort of lighting to skew things. Do we go really left, really right, you know, away from a natural look? Do we go into the extremes of like amber and, you know, what does that look, what does the world look like? Does it look like children of men? Does it look drawn out? Does it look like barren? How do we want to create this landscape? But um, it was really important. I really wanted people to be dedicated to, like you said, the thought behind the film and the characters within the film. I didn't want them to be necessarily distracted by the lo-fi elements of the world and the landscape. I just wanted them to feel organic, seamless, and sort of fit into the reality just five minutes in the future that we might be right. having very close, close to something we all recognize, not for it to feel um, so far-fetched or so far away from our reality that it wouldn't be as terrifying as it might be um so it was important to keep the low the sci-fi very lo-fi and very almost like understated because i just wanted people to focus on the characters and what you were thinking 
at the time and who you were rooting for and why you were rooting for that character and then hopefully flip it on its head with what happens in the film and leave people with something to think about and not necessarily awe them with a jaw-dropping VFX, rather just have them focus on the, the characters uh, and hopefully um, have them, you know, have them have some creative discussion with their friends and family around what's happening in the world because it's very current with chat gpt and mm -hmm. and sort of where we're going it really is a call to action of like where will we sit in the next five years because i very think it is so, happening yeah. around us like every day <laughs> are we going to be able to maintain relationships with friends and family and lovers um and are they going to be present is it going to be created are we going to be able to you know, duplicate personalities and human little idiosyncrasies where, you know, there's these beautiful, like, I mean, seamless moves between AI and what it is to be human and that we don't know the difference. I don't know where we'll land, but where will we stand? I don't know. And I hope that this film kind of leaves audience members questioning where they will stand when this, when they're, you know, they're presented with this new world or this new click mm. that is just sitting on the left side of their screen. Um, and would we, would we go so far to replace loved ones that we've lost? And uh, what does that world look like? All of those things I think is, you know, what I wanted people to focus on instead of the, the VFX. Well, and also in many ways, it almost feels like this is a film that has to be born out of, the creative relationships you've had in the past, because I mean, you've worked with your cinematographer, Russ on, on other shoots before, like how important is the second hand between the director and the DOP when it comes to really crafting a visual style for the film? I'll tell you something for sure. When it comes to moving quickly and moving as a team, sort of sharing the same brain and headspace, when you have a tight, prep time and you're in the middle of a pandemic and you have incredible stars there sitting in front of the camera you need to move quickly efficiently have your ducks in a row but also be able to like lean on you know each other and know that neither one of you will sort of take too much time in terms of either you know performance or lighting because you kind of have to just like move at a lightning speed pace especially with an independent feature of this size like um there's no sitting back, that's for sure. <laughs> so I would say it's it's crucial. And if you don't have that secondhand relationship, you sort of have to create it before you go to camera sure. so that everybody knows exactly what you're doing and the plan of the day is for sure. You don't have time to like... Lucy you know, can see it. You've got yeah, to exactly. boom, boom, yeah. <laughs> now, I mean, yeah. something else I've got to ask because I've got to harp on to something you said before about sort of this film really kind of taking place five minutes into the future. And mm -hmm. part of that feel really was for the came down to the music as well that you used. And and when I did my research and looked it up and then I saw it was the Psycho Gorman guys, I was like, oh, my God, that's so fantastic. When in the process of building something like this, do you bring on composers? Because, I mean, I can imagine it can go both ways. Sometimes you want them early on. Sometimes it'll be like, no, here's the final cut. Put some music to it. Mm -hmm. I started, I, I mean, I shot list to score all the time. So I start thinking music really early on. Like it's almost goes as I'm reading the script, like very early, even script notes and stuff. It's before I even shot list, I'm sort of in the vibes of score and music that inspires me. And then while I'm shot listing, I'm always in the mood of those music and those musicians and whatever that score might be that's similar to, um, and then, of course, when you make the film, sometimes I share the music with the cast and sometimes I share it even with the DP and other creators just to get them inspired and get them um, on the same wavelength because it is such a huge piece of the puzzle for me. Like it really creates a world and an atmosphere and one that's very clear, like music speaks so many languages. Um, so I, I hope to share it early. And then, of course, once you have a final product, sometimes it completely changes. <laughs> like the film which you thought was going to be one way geared a different way or you know performances shifted the tone in a different direction or the tone of one scene really needs help in another direction to bring something else about so after that I sort of go through a note session with the composers and really it's almost like um, the DVD behind the scenes when you hear the right. filmmakers talk over it. so I do a full session with the composers like that where you 
you know, they ask questions and I sort of explain every little micro moment that I would like to hit or why things work, why things didn't. And, you know, put temp score in there and say, ignore it here, or enhance this here. Um, and I loved working with our composers. And we came up with this great concept of like, what if, because Evan plays the piano, what if the Evan sort of face side of things is organic and more earthbound and comes from, you know, instruments that we all know for instance, the piano, mm -hmm. but have it be played in a way that no human being could ever play it. So getting it here first, this is a secret. If you actually listen to all of the score pieces between Evan and Faye, the piano itself is what could be created by AI only and not a left and right hand of a human being with two wow. hands. So it's really special, really unique and no one would ever know that except I'm telling you now. But um, <laughs> these are the details that make me really excited. Um, and we were really excited creating sort of that theme. So it's actually AI driven um, music, but it's meant to theme and feel very organic and human. Um, and then on the Sam and Simu side, sort of the chase and the simulate side of things, we went with all kinds of electronic sounds, like what, a, you know, I don't know, a toner sounds like, what a hard drive sounds like, what the inside of a fan sounds like. And we pulled all these unique sources and sort of put them together, put them backwards, reverb on them, and um, created a soundscape that was all very electronic based and very like computer based and hard drive based. So like, I think the sound of a Tesla engine, like all the electronic sounds that we could pull are layered very deeply in the score that is the Simu and um, Sam side of things. So if you're really into music and you go into a deep dive, Simulate has a lot of tasty treats in there. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Now, I mean, I'm kind of curious because obviously you know, you've got an extensive history doing a lot of different films, but you've also done a lot of TV work as well. And I'm always curious, how does the TV work inform sort of the independent film work and kind of vice versa? Mm -hmm. That's a thoughtful question. I, I, what I love about TV is that it's quick. You get to dapple in several different genres in the same year, let's say. I get to do everything from like Spencer Sisters to something like Blood and Treasure or Tiny Pretty Things. You know, they're really fast and you spend like six weeks with them and then it's and then it's gone. So you get to be really immersed in a genre with new creative people all the time and work, you know, with new people and new skills. And then it's like, disappears almost before a blink of an eye. Whereas a feature film, I feel like you have to be very motivated and very dedicated to a long haul. Like it's almost like a five year, six year venture. By the time you get it financed, put the pieces together, um, get it cast and then you're filming and then you're doing, you know, editing, color correct, sound design, composing. You really are at the helm of a big long adventure so it's like a beautiful marriage and um you have to put the time in and you have to stay motivated so i almost find like when i go off to do tv it reinvigorates me i learn new things i'm exposed to new people new genres new characters new costumes new everything and it's sort of whatever i the energy i get to have in that frenetic exciting quick turnaround i bring to my long beautiful relationship that is with film and it sort of spices it up in a good way so that I can continue to be focused on that film and get it to the finish line because you have to be constantly motivated and reminded to not let it go and stay committed and um so they you know they ping pong off one another for sure in terms of energy and um, I also love both of them like equally, but they're just such different beasts to me. <laughs> um, has but part of, uh, has part of that sort of been sort of your drive to 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 mix it up genre wise as well? Because I mean, you can't necessarily draw a straight line from something like Far Hope to Below Her Mouth or from Wander to to this film. They're different projects. Like you never. People have tried to pigeonhole you as like a filmmaker and a storyteller, but really it's kind of been impossible. You've been doing a lot of very different stuff. I know. I've been tried to pin down into a box and it's probably because I love life so much. I can't fit in the box. <laughs> um, 
It's funny. I got, I had the honor of meeting Ridley Scott who absolutely loved Wander. So I got flown down to LA and he was like, don't let them put you in a box. I can tell you like everything, just find those good stories and those big worlds that it like motivate you and you want to create and do your thing. And I was like, that's exactly right. I mean, I just, if something speaks to me and I know that I'm the only one could, that could bring certain things to the screen when it comes to that feature film or that TV series. It's a challenge and I like it and I want to be able to do it because I know that it'll be special. But if it's something that sort of anybody could do and um, doesn't fit sort of a quirky or eccentric or, you know, unique character or something that I can tap into that's my truth, then it doesn't make sense for me to do it because anybody, you know, could sort of fill that slot. I really like to push myself creatively and do things that I'm afraid of and do things, you know, that excite me at the same time. So a little bit of everything. <laughs> well, and I mean, I love that because I mean, there it, it shows the love of just story and, and telling different stories. I mean, I loved Wander too. I mean, I'm with Ridley. I mean, that's a great, that's a great movie. That movie did not get enough love. I'm just telling you that right now, but. I know it came out during the pandemic. I know. Hopefully whoever sees Simulate will say, who are these people? And then they'll go back and see Wander and say, holy shit, Aaron Eckhart is <laughs> phenomenal. <laughs> Like it's his best performance. And Tommy is so cool in those 70 aviators and those wicked shirts. And he's so Absolutely. sly. I mean, hopefully people will just eat it up after this. <laughs> I mean, just to start putting a bow on this, because I mean, obviously this is a science fiction film. It works inside sort of the genre, you know, precept, but it, it allows for a lot of freedom in telling very sort of layered stories what is it about genre, be it sci-fi or a thriller or what have you, that allows for a certain kind of freedom to to not tell a story, you know, like you said, a story that's not going to be inside a box, a story that's going to sort of range outside that box? Yeah, I the best thing about genre and genre filmmaking and genre scripts is that you have a creative world that you get to build. And there are rules within that world that you get to make. So it doesn't doesn't necessarily have to fit the exact mold that we see around us or a film that had been made before. You can sort of create your own Bible and set of landscape or blueprint, and then you create your own rules. And as long as you fall within those, you can have Zemans making out and creating other Zemans in Dead Before Dawn, or you can have the curse be, um, you know, happen through active eye contact. And, you know, in Simulate, you know, service androids look like our Lisa. Like, how exciting is that? Yeah. I don't even know what that is, but it's our Lisa and I love her. <laughs> um, so you get to create, really get to create things from the ground up. And I love that freedom so much. And you get to do that with how you use the camera too. You know, in Wander, I'm inside of Arthur's head and it's yeah. messy and it's confusing and it's it's shaky and it's dirty on purpose. And this one's sort of like overly pristine, overly stoic, overly clean, a little bit weird because it's just too AI. You know, like everything's a bit still in a way. Like what is the world coming to? Why are, you know, why doesn't it feel as alive and as frenetic as Wander? It's it's fun to be able to have the film reflect the script in an extreme way, so to speak, and create your own world and, and rules, but then creatively also match that at a new height. And yeah. whether it be the color palette or the music, like we just talked about, or even the actors and their performances, whether tonally they shift, you know, completely into a into a happy place like Spencer Sisters, which I had the honor of shooting the pilot for. I mean, they're all so dramatically different, but within um, genre films, you really get to create your own world. And it's it's phenomenal to be able to have, you know, in this day and age to be able to play in a sandbox like that. <laughs> oh, for sure. I mean, I, I keep wanting to call it Simulant, but Simulant, I mean, obviously carves out this really distinct space. And I mean, it may not be excessively flashy, but I think it's going to be one of those movies that it's going to have a chance for people to be talking about it for years and years because it just brings up so many interesting ideas and concepts that we're going to be grappling with you know, like you said, not just five minutes from now, but five, 10, 20 years from now. Yeah, I do think it's sort of a defining film for the generation just before AI really starts taking over. So I think it kind of puts a stamp on us. And the film sort of is a is a great example of where we are 
Mm-hmm. And it is sort of at a crossroads. Where will we go in the next five years? years we really have no idea and i love that it it poses that question to the audience just before it happens <laughs> exactly but you know what april just keep up the good work it's fantastic to see you again i can't wait until the next time but again just thank you so much for the time and congrats on the film i really loved it oh thanks so much and thanks for the time as well and um, i'll see you in the next one for sure absolutely that's a date for sure thank you so much and don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental, or purchasing needs this summer, as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and Blu-ray needs.